Hi everyone, so today I'm going to be talking about the case of Dirty John. There's a great series on Netflix that is based on this story. Um, I recommend checking it out because it's quite accurate in its portrayal. And there's also a great podcast made by Christopher Gofford of the LA Times where he actually interviews some of the victims and individuals involved. And he's able to get into a ton of detail that I will just not be able to do here. So instead of focusing on John in this video, my aim is really to highlight and focus on what the women of the story were able to do. Um, the narrative takes us to Newport Beach, California in the Irvine area in the fall of 2014. We're following Deborah Newell, who was 59 at the time. She had four children and she had been married four times. She had a very successful interior design business called Ambrosia um, and she was a very successful woman but she was single and she was looking for love. She was a very attractive woman with great taste but that one element was missing from her life and she really wanted to find a partner that uh, she could spend her forever with. So Deborah took to online dating, and even though she had been on multiple dates with different people, she really wasn't that interested in them. But then, on October 10th of 2014, she met John and they went on their first date. Um, John Meehan was born on February 3rd of 1958 in California, and he had three siblings. Um, he stated in his profile that he was an anesthesiologist, that he had children from a previous marriage and that he was a Christian church-going man, all of which really appealed to Deborah. So on their first date, John picked up Deborah uh, from her penthouse apartment in Irvine, and the first thing she actually noted was that he was severely underdressed. He just wore a basic t-shirt, um, shorts, and flip-flops, and she said he reminded her of a frat guy. But they nonetheless had a great time on their first date. John told her all about his work as an anesthesiologist, he told her um, all about his time that he spent in Iraq uh, where he worked under the Doctors Without Borders, and he told her all these heroic stories from Iraq. But more than that, he was extremely attentive to her, he was very interested in her and her life, he was very caring, attentive, and he would always constantly tell her how beautiful and attractive she was. But after the dinner portion of their date, they went back to her apartment and that's when things got a little bit strange. John went into Deborah's uh, bedroom, laid down on her mattress, and made a comment that the mattress feels incredible. This obviously weirded her out a little bit and, because there was a strange man that she had just met laying in her bed. Um, so she basically asked him to leave and that's how their first date ended. So Deborah was really disappointed that things had ended this way. Uh, she really had high hopes for this um, and she was really impressed by him. Um, but John called her the next day basically apologizing for his behavior and asking her for forgiveness and to give him another chance. Deborah did give him another chance and they proceeded to date. Um, John would always show up wearing the same frat guy looking clothes to all their dates or alternatively he would wear medical scrubs. He even wore these medical scrubs to a ch cancer benefit charity event that she invited him to uh, where everyone else, including Deborah, uh, they were really dressed up for this event. So by the third date, John was already telling Deborah that he loves her and that he wants to marry her. Uh, in one of their email exchanges, Deborah asked if he's, if he's the real deal, to which John replied saying that he's the best thing that will ever happen to her. At this point of the story, we meet the second important woman, and that is Jacqueline, Deborah's 24-year-old daughter who had been living with her at the time. Uh, John started to spend a lot more time in their apartment, which really didn't sit well with Jacqueline. When meeting him for the first time, she explained that he looked homeless and that he looked focused. Uh, remember, Deborah was a well-off woman, so her penthouse apartment was really reflective of that. And she was able to pick up on the fact that John looked like he was scanning it out and sizing it out. One time when John was over at their apartment, um, he walked into Jacqueline's bedroom and he asked her about the safe that she had in her closet. Jacqueline had a collection of very expensive purses that she wanted to keep in pristine condition, but him asking her about the safe really made her feel uncomfortable and it made her question him even more. 
Uh, but Deborah brushed it off that her kids were just once again being overprotective and that they didn't like any of the men that she had previously dated. However, I think these, this speaks volumes of how important it is to listen to our own intuition and gut and that of our loved ones. Even though uh, Deborah may have ignored some of these red flags, Jacqueline was able to intuitively pick up on them. Um, I think that Jacqueline's intuitive ability uh, to listen to her own gut and intuition is definitely one of the things that she can be commended for. So after a few of these minor altercations between John and Jacqueline, Deborah and John decided to rent out their own place only after knowing each other for five weeks. Deborah paid the rent out uh, a year in advance for a nice place in Balboa, Newport Beach, but she did not tell her kids that uh, they were going to move in together. At this point, we meet uh, Deborah's younger daughter, Tara. Tara was a kind, gentle, and a physically petite girl who had been living with her boyfriend Jimmy in Vegas at the time. Tara and Jimmy came down to check out Deborah's new place and to meet John for the very first time. But right after meeting John, they felt like he was frustrated that they were there, he really didn't seem happy to be meeting them, and he actually barely said hi to Tara at all. At this point, Tara didn't know that John was living there, but she noticed that all his stuff was laying around, so she asked her mom if um, he was living with her, to which Deborah said he wasn't. Um, but it seemed odd to her that he was just playing video games all day long, that he didn't have a place of his own, that he was just driving her cars, and that he seemed seemingly unbusy for a doctor. So she decided to have a look around, and she found a knowing this man to be talking to her in this way. But Deborah sided with John, and they decided to uninvite Tara and Jimmy from Thanksgiving dinner. Um, John explained everything away to Deborah, basically saying that he had a PhD instead of an MD, which made him a doctor. And um, he said that her kids were just jealous of her and that they wanted her money and that they were way out of line to be speaking to her like that. Thanksgiving of 2014 is when John met Deborah's mother, who initially really liked him because she just thought he was so kind and wonderful to her daughter. Um, unlike Tara, Jacqueline had attended the Thanksgiving dinner, but had another altercation with John at this event. The altercation ultimately led Deborah and the kids to seek the help of a psychologist, who ended up siding with Deborah and suggested that her kids should not be having that much input into her life. The psychologist uh, suggested that certain boundaries be set in place um, that would really limit the amount of input her kids were able to have. In early December of 2014, Deborah had to go on a business trip to Vegas and John decided he wanted to come along. And only after knowing each other for two months, he begged her to marry him. So they went to a courthouse and they got married. Nobody attended the wedding and they wanted to keep their marriage a secret. On Christmas of 2014, uh, Jacqueline refused to uh, participate in the family event, but Tara wanted to go under the condition they agreed upon in therapy that John wasn't going to be around the kids at all. But John ended up bringing a full bag of gifts and presents for the children, so this uh, upset Tara that her end of the bargain wasn't being held up. She was perceived as being overly emotional and overreacting to the situation by her family, um, but she and Jacqueline, this just made them dislike him even more and to question him and his intentions even further. In February of 2015, uh, Jacqueline was very suspicious of John given everything that's happened, so she asked her mom if she'd be able to put a tracker on one of the cars that he drove. Um, she put a tracker on the car and she was looking for a pattern of behavior. But all that she was able to find was that he would drive to various clinics that weren't in the area, that he would drive to fast food places, the gas station, the gym, um, so there wasn't really anything there that amounted to evidence that she'd be able to present to her mom at this time. Deborah described this time as being very blissful. She, she did not want to believe her kids that John was a bad guy because he really came off as the perfect husband. He was very attentive to her, he asked about her day, he held her hand, they would take long walks on the beach. He, she said he had a fun-loving side to him, uh, but most importantly, he made her feel loved. 
And one day when they came home, they found a strange woman in their apartment wearing Demra's clothes. They obviously called the police, but they didn't press charges. Um, but this led John to ramp up the security system in their house and at Deborah's place of work. Initially, this made Deborah feel safe and glad to have John there sort of protecting over her, but it didn't take her long to question why the cameras were really there. Now we meet Chad, Deborah's nephew. Deborah's sister Cindy was killed by her husband, and Chad ended up being raised by Debbie and Deborah's mother. Shad was aware that Jacqueline and Tara didn't like John, but he himself wanted to give him another chance. He initially liked him. John shared his heroic stories from Iraq, how he had to carry a gun to protect himself, how he jumped out of helicopters, and they bonded over certain things like sports. However, when the subject of Jacqueline came up, um, John made a comment about being able to take her out from a thousand yards out. This obviously made Shad feel uncomfortable that John made a comment about killing one of his family members, um, and that's when he definitely realized that something was wrong with him. Shad went to Jacqueline with this information, and they decided to hire a private investigator. The private investigator was able to find out that John was not a doctor, but that he had a nursing certificate, that John had spent some time in prison, that he had many addresses across different states, and that the latest address in his name was traced to an RV park. Shad went to Deborah with this, asking her what she would do if he could prove that John was not a doctor, that he never went to Iraq, and that he spent time in prison, and Deborah said that she wouldn't care. Deborah ended up telling John what her family found out, which angered John, and he ended up texting Shad horrible things and revealing to him that he and Deborah were now married. But Deborah had a turning point herself. One day she went to pick up mail and she found a letter that was addressed to John that was sent from someone uh, who had been in prison. Uh, John was able to see that she was opening his mail from the security cameras he had installed and when he saw that she was opening his mail, he came down screaming at her that opening other people's mail is a felony. But he was once again able to explain himself away and say that this was just a pen pal he was sending care packages to. But this event made Deborah question John herself. She ended up going through some of his paperwork and she found that a number of women had filed restraining orders against him, that he had a number of felonies on his record, um, that he had nine social security numbers, and that he had spent quite some time in jail, and that he had actually been in jail just two days before meeting Deborah. This made her rethink their, their first date entirely, and it made her understand why John had made the comment about her mattress feeling incredible. After finding all of this out, Deborah was treading lightly. John had been admitted to a hospital due to a medical emergency, so Deborah thought this would be a good time to seek legal help. She found a lawyer who believed John to be a really dangerous man after hearing everything that she has gone through, and he advised her to have her marriage immediately annulled. Deborah started to wear wigs, lit out, live out of hotels, and wear different clothes in hopes of being in disguise. When John realized Deborah was leaving him, he first attacked her character in every way possible by texting her horrible things, but then, as a master manipulator, he began to lure her back in by making crazy declarations of love, telling her how much he loves her, that he's, he is flawed but that he will change for her, and he basically begged her to come see him and to forgive him. Deborah did go see him in the hospital. He begged her for forgiveness, he said that everything is just a big misunderstanding, and he gave her an answer for everything. He said that the restraining orders must have been filed against other people and not him, that he lied about being a doctor and lied about other things because he just thought she was so wonderful and just so out of his league, and he basically begged her to take him back and told her that she's the best thing that's ever happened to him. I think it's hard for people to understand where Deborah was coming from in this case, why she kept going back to this man, all the while knowing who he was, at least to some degree. But perhaps her background of being raised within a culture of extreme forgiveness may have played somewhat of a role in her continually forgiving him. She was raised within a seemingly strong Christian household. Her own mother even testified on behalf of her son-in-law who had killed her own daughter, so that strong Christian influence that encourages forgiveness definitely played at least somewhat of a role in this case. But she was also just in love with him and she was willing to believe anything that he was saying. 
And in addition to that, she was in a relationship with a master manipulator who was able to lure in very um, educated, um, intelligent, and highly successful women. So it's not that hard to imagine why she kept going back. In April of 2015, John and Deborah were back together. John wanted to show Deborah that he was innocent in all the cases where straining orders were placed against him. So in an attempt to show Deborah that he was innocent, he hired a lawyer. While the lawyer could tell that Deborah was a nice and kind-hearted woman, he thought that John was the scariest man he's ever met in his life. While Deborah was doing this to ease her, the mind of her family, um, he could tell that John had ulterior motives because he became angrier whenever the idea of having a post snub came up. Um, he actually ended up firing the lawyer because he didn't agree with having a post snub and filing a complaint against him with the Bar Association. The lawyer described his experience being around John as being in the presence of evil incarnate. John didn't want Deborah to be around her kids at all. He blamed them for everything, and he saw them as a barrier between him and his end goal. But being prevented from being around her children really made Deborah think that she had made a mistake. She described this time as being really terrifying. She was helping John overcome his drug addiction, and she felt anxious whenever she'd come home because she didn't know whether she was going to find him doing drugs or being with another woman. But she kept in touch with Jacqueline, and when John found out that she was in touch with her daughter, he started to harass Jacqueline by texting her terrible things. He told her that jumping off a tall building would make him smile, and he even slandered her name at her real estate school. When Deborah saw what was going on, she withdrew 120 k from her account. John confronted her about the missing money and asked what she, what she was doing. And uh, when she told him that it's her money and that she can do whatever she wants with it, he asked her to hit him and threatened her life. And that is when Deborah asked for a divorce. In June of 2016, Deborah had once again been living out of hotels, wearing different wigs and different clothes in hopes of being in disguise. One day when she was leaving from her office, she found that her Jaguar was missing from her lot. Two days later, the car was found and it reeked of gasoline as if somebody had attempted to light the car on fire. Even though the surveillance footage placed John at the scene, police still didn't arrest him. This got Deborah and the kids extremely worried, uh, especially Jacqueline because she knew he hated her the most and she was the biggest target, but they were now convinced that John was really capable of doing anything. At this point, Deborah had cut him off financially completely and she wasn't responding to his text at all, and both Tara and Jacqueline felt as if they were being watched. August 19 of 2016, Jacqueline was returning from dinner with a friend when she saw that John had been watching her from his car. She got her driver to follow him, but they lost him along the way, but she, what she now knew was that John had in fact been watching them. She didn't call the police because they never did anything about it, but she went to Tara's apartment and saw that she was fine. She called her the next morning, warning her that John had been watching them and that he's in a white Camry, but in the dark, Jacqueline had misidentified the car. Tara Newell was described as being sweet and having a huge heart. At the time, she worked at a pet parlor, and one day she received a call from a man who specifically asked for her work schedule and specifically wanted her to groom his pet. On August 20th of 2016, Tara went to work. She knew she had to hose at the cages that day, so she wore her rain boots. She had her dog Cash with her in the back seat, and that night she was supposed to go see the Jason Aldean concert. The men who called in never showed up, but then when she was sitting in the parking lot, she saw a homeless looking man in his car watching her. John Meehan had a kidnapped kid in his car, backpack, duct tape, six knives, cable ties, and a passport. He was six foot two but lost a significant amount of weight by this time. Tara got out of the car and he walked behind her. He grabbed her, looked her in the eyes, and asked if she remembers him. He tried to put his hand over her mouth, but she bit him. He tried to stab her repeatedly and managed to stab her deeply in the arm. Her dog, Cash, was biting his ankles, and as she fell to the ground, he tried getting on top of her, getting hold of her, and stabbing her repeatedly. Overlooking the parking lot was an apartment complex, and a 14-year-old girl overheard Tara screaming from outside. She saw a man holding a knife over her, and she called the police. She bolted down to Tara with a towel, and she was mesmerized that the other witnesses weren't helping. 
Hair was on her back, and because she had worn her rain boots, she was able to knock the knife out of his hand, and it landed inches away from her face. She grabbed the knife, and she started to stab him repeatedly. She stabbed him in the shoulder multiple times, in his chest, in his upper back, in his tricep, in his forearm, and the last wound was to the left eye, which penetrated into his brain. And that's when John fell heavily on top of her. John was not breathing when the paramedics arrived. Tara asked if she had killed him, and they told her she did, but that they were able to revive him. John had 13 stab wounds and was brain dead. His sister Karen came to the hospital and she made the call to take him off life support. John Meehan died on August 24th of 2016, four days after he attacked Tara Newell. I think the woman of the story needs to be commended, Jacqueline, for her persistence in helping her mother even though her life was in danger, and for her ability to listen to her own intuition and instincts. Deborah for having the courage and strength to leave this very manipulative and toxic man. The 14 year old girl for being there to help Tara when nobody else would. And Tara for having the mental and physical strength to defend herself and her family against him and preventing him from ever